So, ladies and gentlemen, I think slowly but surely uh, we can start. Um, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this uh, very exciting talk, I think. I think it's not only the title that's quite exciting. Uh, spies and diplomats, two sides of international politics that some of you may think are very, very distinct. Um, I think one of the outcomes of today's discussion will be that they're not always that distinct, um, but in any way, it's definitely a very interesting topic um, that uh, I think will generate lots of new insights uh, for us. My name is Markus Kornprops. I'm professor of political science at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. And uh, I first want to introduce you to today's speaker briefly, and then uh, we're going to start with a little chat between the two of us. It's going to last about 40 minutes, and then for the last 20 minutes, you have ample opportunity to ask questions. Um, our speaker today, Professor Mihai Ungurianu, has done a lot of things, and uh, he really is an ideal speaker on the topic of diplomats and spies. But when I sketch his biography to you very briefly, then I think it's going to become quite clear uh, straight away. Professor Ungurianu holds a doctorate from Alexander Ioan Cusa University in Yasi in Romania. Um, he quickly established himself as a very successful scientist with a particular focus on history. Among other things, he was professor at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London, Andrew Mellon Fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, a fellow at St. Cross College in Oxford, and a visiting research at the History Department of the Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg. And uh, Professor Ungurian has always continued his academic career. Today, he is professor of East European Modern History at the University of Bucharest. And he continues to work as visiting professor and research fellow elsewhere. And uh, Vienna is actually very lucky that he does quite a few things here in the city as well. Um, he is a visiting professor at the Diplomatic Academy and, uh, and a research fellow at the Institute of Human Sciences. Um, he published five books, lots of articles, book chapters and all of that. And uh, for his academic uh, work, he also received uh, several prizes and distinctions. I'm not going to go all that much into that now. Um, but let me go to the second side uh, of his curriculum vitae. Uh, and this is probably the one that most of you are familiar with. Um, he made a pretty good career in politics. For three years, he served as the foreign minister of Romania, then for five years as director of the foreign intelligence service. So you see already spies and diplomats. He really can tell us something about that. In 2012, he became prime minister of Romania. Then he served as senator in the Romanian parliament, and he became again director of the foreign intelligence service. Um, I think at that stage, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, stop briefly. If I would be now very strict in terms of protocol in the foreign ministry, then uh, with all the titles and everything and excellencies, I think it would be something like three lines how I would have to address him properly. Um, but just very, very briefly, Excellency Professor Colleague Dear Mihai, we would like to welcome you to this conversation. Now, Mihai, I um, prepared a couple of questions. Uh, some are perhaps a little more introductory, um, others go a little more into detail. The most introductory one that I want to ask you, uh, usually when we look at spying, when we look at intelligence, then we think that this really is the darker side of international affairs. So jokingly, may I ask you the question, do we have to be afraid of you? Um, yeah, prior to answering this question, I have to tell the audience that it's been a stage question. We thought about it some couple of days prior to our meeting in this hall. Thank you very much, Professor Kornpros and dear Marcus, for uh, joining uh, me and us this uh, beautiful uh, early afternoon in, in sunny Vienna. I owe um, um, 
a lot to uh, Professor Shalini Randiria, who's the rector of the Institute for the Wissenschaften for Menschen, who graciously uh, hosts me there and my project. To Ivan Vevoda, who happens to be here and uh, who's uh, one of the engines of the Viennese uh, Humanities Festival and with his project. Dr. Buzek, whom uh, I know for quite a long time, we worked together. He was my boss, as you are today, uh, and I owe him a lot as well. And again, gratitude to all those who are present uh, today, uh, people that I know, people I've been befriended to, and people I worked with. Um, no, nobody should be afraid of me for as long as I know, because I'm not an institution, first. Uh, and second, uh, it's not about fears. It's about power and powerlessness, as the title of the festival uh, speaks about, um, or about power the, and the incapacity of organizing power in the realm of the modern state. Uh, so it's less about fearing me as an individual as perhaps fearing what could happen if institutions would not be reigned in a way that would care about human rights, for example, or for the welfare of the state in general. Uh, thank you very much for um, going through my, uh, let's say, political biography. Um, I acknowledge that besides my academic career, um, I've been professing to, yes, I would say, two of the eldest professions in this world. I can see some of you smiling. No, it's not about that profession. No, it's about something else. Uh, I, I, well, actually, it's about the politicians, mostly. This reminds me of a joke when some people gathered together and started discussing between them which would have been the first profession ever since the inception of the world. And some said lawyers, and others and others and others, but nevertheless, the one, there was one who said no, the eldest profession in this world is that of politician. And to the very stupor of the others, to the question, why, for God's sake, politicians, said, who created the chaos prior to the earth to come up? So the chaos was created by politicians. So basically, it's about politics. Now, yes, I've been fortunate enough to go to live on both sides of the world, on the lit side and on the hidden side. And um, I have to say by chance that it added to the knowledge one could have about what is happening in the world, how general processes, if in international relations, if not in international policy, unfold. Um, it's been a career quite an exceptional in the sense of um, no other people would have gone through this. An exceptional career, which again is not always, is not just based, I would say, with no shadow of arrogance, is not about immediate personal merits, as it is about the very hazard of, um, of politics. Um, so far about uh, this question, first, questions of, first question of yours. Um, I'd be interested in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in the nuts and bolts of every day's conduct of affairs as a foreign minister when it comes to dealing with intelligence. Can you tell us something about that? So, on a, on a very normal day as a foreign minister, uh, how do you come in contact, perhaps there with the director of intelligence? How do you factor intelligence into your decisions? Um, I, I'm tempted to, 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 to say something else 
before answering the question. Um, diplomacy and intelligence, there, it's, it's about a strange bedfellowship here. Um, it's not complementing each other. They're different, they're different jobs. Uh, their description as jobs is different. Um, it's about different qualities and different targets. It's about different legal fundamentals and different professional ethics. Yes, spies do have a certain professional ethic. Second, it's about truth and about knowledge. The more you know, the better you can face dangers and even more important, the larger and the deeper your capacity of preventing something bad from happening. In this case, from happening to your own country or to the state you represent. Um, what I allude at is very much what everybody knows, it's common knowledge, is Francis Bacon famous dictum about the quantity of power that's hidden in the very meaning of knowledge and in the quantity of knowledge one could have. Yes, indeed, knowledge is power. And it would take quite a lot of effort to have as much knowledge as possible, thus acquiring larger portions of power. Because power is important in the very framework of international relations. It's not about defining hierarchies, but it's about power as a tool of persuasion. May it be military power, may it be economic power, political power, cultural power, social power. The more one state gets, the better it stands. Ministers of Foreign Affairs would be, at least in principle, theoretically, exposed to knowledge that is, it is usually kept hidden under the seal of secrecy. And the seal of secrecy is important for those very pieces of knowledge that, if made public, would put state institutions or a nation itself or the state itself under danger or even in the, in the danger of disappearing to take it to the very limit. Secret, because di diplomats and spies deal with secrets. Secrets, secrecy, as a famous sociologist one put it, Georg Simmel, lays at the very fundament of the modern state. And those secrets, have to be kept away from the profane eye. This is where the spies come into the discussion. They hunt for those secrets with no limit whatsoever in, in the sense of common morality or ethics and performing through their duties abroad illegal acts only. So there are, in this sense, criminals abroad, but loyal citizens to their own country. Now, a Minister of Foreign Affairs, I was saying, is exposed to both kinds of information, diplomatic bits of information that have been reaped publicly by diplomats in their milieus where they function, politics, economy, cultural milieus in, the countries, in their countries of residence and where they work as diplomats representing their country openly, publicly, and information of a discreet quality or completely dark, quote unquote, that would add the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and not just the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but other legal beneficiaries too, to better direct 
better assess their options, their strategic options, when it comes to the very targets or the very projects one country might have. It is important, they're not just information that could calibrate political decision. Sometimes it is that kind of information onto which political decisions are based. And I feel the need to say something else as well from this point of view. It's not about truth. And I know it's paradoxical. Intelligence, which is hidden information, or information under the seal of secrecy, as well as diplomatic information, diplomatic intelligence, extending the meaning of this word, they're not about the truth. It's about approximate truth. Because if the truth would be available to all of us, with no further ado, there'll be no need for such an institution. Since the truth is not to be seen under our very eyes, and it, because it is very abstract in itself, those institutions, ministries of foreign affairs, diplomatic institutions, intelligence agency, they work with approximate truths. When I would say approximate, please put into brackets the first syllable. It's bracket, AP, bracket, proximate. Is as close as possible to a presumptive truth. Second, it needs to be accurate. It may not have a full value from the point of view of its relation with the truth, capital letter, but it should be accurate. That is, not distorted. So ministers would work with both. Sometimes this binary flux of information could help into taking decisions. Sometimes not. Because there are different categories of interests that meet at the crossroads in the cabinet of a Minister of Foreign Affairs. And as it may happen sometimes, those very dark bits of information cannot be used. They add to a sort of a passive knowledge of the situation, but they might, they might be of no real use in proper diplomatic terms. Um, diplomacy is often defined as communication across nations. And uh, it is for the most part, or increasingly now in our days, open. So we talk about public diplomacy and all sorts of things. Um, what about intelligence agencies? What kind of communication happens between intelligence agencies from different nations? Um, I would say that the difference between diplomats and, and, and intelligence um, employees lays not only in the fact that diplomats would work their, uh, their projects in the open or bring the uh, decisions of their ministry or the different other executive bodies to a certain fulfillment. Mechanically, the same happens with intelligence agencies. They would take an order or a decision, an executive decision, and try to put it into practice. Whereas the diplomats would try to steer the foreign policy directions of the state into a direction that would, uh, uh, onto an axis that would help that state preserve its sovereignty, its independence, its, states of, its state of welfare. Diploma, uh, spies are actually seeking for fractures in whatever other state they would be posted to. So that by knowing the hidden side of other countries, they would add to a very positive 
policies, to very positive policies of their own country, whose citizens they are. Now, intelligence agencies are very national. They cannot federate, they cannot coalesce, they would have a kind of dialogue between themselves, provided there is a topic, a general topic, of, um, related to fears, or to, that would um, uh, worry other nations in the world, um, such as, for example, international, uh, well, international traffic of weaponry or drugs, organized crime in general, transnational organized crime in general, terrorism. These are subjects that would interest ministers of foreign affairs, ministers of internal affairs, intelligence agencies alike. And they would be forced to cooperate on this very matter, maybe exchange information. In cases, the degree of credibility and responsibility is high enough to admit it. Because if in the world of diplomacy we could speak about friends and foes, general states have a sort of family of friends and the lesser possible foes, allies and enemies. In the world of intelligence, there are no friends. There are no foes either. There are only targets. And the range, the family of targets, is very large. The only target that is not there is one's own country. But for the rest, may they be neighbors or political allies or military allies, they are, those countries are targets. So from this point of view, this is where diplomats and spies part destinies. Diplomats will just float in the open and negotiate that's the main reason why ministries of foreign affairs exist. Spies will hover under the earth in the very subterranean foundations of state institutions and never negotiate. Maybe keep up a kind of a dialogue with their peers from other countries, but never negotiate. There is nothing to negotiate when stealing secrets. Um, I'd like to move to international order. Um, is it possible to say that intelligence services stabilize international politics, international order? Or do they destabilize it? Or are there certain conditions attached to any of those? Are there certain conditions under which it stabilizes others, under which it destabilizes? In this, in this hazy world, since intelligence agencies are an institutional expression of states' sovereignty, they have to be seen and their activities interpreted as run by the state itself. So if the state is feeble or, or has no definite line of conduct, or has no possibility or no imagination, creative imagination, about its own position in the world or interests. The same problem or the same amount of problems is reflected onto the intelligence agencies. When states are just unclear about, unclear about their whereabouts, and interests, so are the intelligence agencies. In this case, they could well contribute to a larger degree of international relations entropy. In the same, by the same token, they could be on the contrary, some of the best guardians of a certain, maybe happier um, uh, situation at the level of international affairs we should not 
forget that intelligence agencies are politically influenced by domestic policies in their, from their respective countries. And besides, their action is politically conducted. Cases like the famous yellow cake joke, as we all know, has put a seed of disruption into the, um, uh, uh, into the picture of international relations we, we, we were accustomed to from before 2003. That yellow cake joke was in fact a make-up issue that came with intelligence agencies under the very pressure of political, of domestic politicians. So, cases of the kind would happen. On the other hand, nowadays, facing, because of facing so many international threats, agencies are quite likely, as I was saying, to cooperate, at least to have a, sort, a certain dialogue between themselves, which is, it's an, interne it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that before 1989, there were two camps, major camps, where intelligence agencies would have found themselves, the Western camp and the Soviet, the Soviet bloc camp. There was a kind of dialogue between Western intelligence agencies and socialist at the time intelligence agencies, more or less guided by the larger um, uh, superpowers of the, of the time. After 1989, the value of multilateralism started being installed bit by bit into the very mechanisms of intelligence, of collection of intelligence and intelligence managing, management, sorry. Today, there are formats of multilateral cooperation between intelligence agencies, which, funny enough, tend to replicate formats and habits of multilateral cooperation that have been for years and years exercised at the level of ministries of foreign affairs. The difference between diplomats and spies would not vanish, but it's an interesting transfer of cultural, of, 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 of cultural behavior at the level of the institutions. Um, Intelligence agencies may have their own sort of ambassadors, that is, employees that would be sent in the country to represent the interests of that intelligence agencies, agency, which would be in the open. And everybody would know that that fellow would represent an, in an intelligence agency. He would not hide it from the eyes of the locals. And this is, again, an example how in institutional behaviors today would tend to be replicated, both in the sun or in the dark. We sometimes hear that uh, multilateralism in our world is in decline, uh, so that it may have been something of the 90s and, 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 and now in the last five years or so it's been in decline. Can we observe a similar development when it comes to intelligence agencies? No, I wouldn't say so. Because there is no equivalent of United Nations organization, the level of intelligence agencies. But there is a sort of a awareness that, in general, intelligence agencies would specialize themselves into something. When representing, for example, a literal country, there'll be quite likely that that intelligence agency would know more about, I don't know, migrants coming across the waves you know, or across the sea. Um, some others who are in deeply entrenched into the continent would know more about, I don't know, about China. These bits of specific intelligence would be complemented then in a larger in forming a larger picture with, with what other intelligence agencies would know. But this is not, again, 
that kind of multilateralism we are accustomed to, um, uh, to, to, to discuss about when referring to the international relations world at the level of ministries of foreign affairs or foreign representation, for alleged representation. It's a, it's, it's a different kind of pragmatics which abides a different philosophy of political pragmatism, which uh, um, that could be um, uh, abstracted into something like this, you are my target, says intelligence agency A to intelligence agency B, you are a target, your country is a target for mine, but on issues that are of mutual concern, we agree to exchange information and maybe work together. If the trust between, our, between us is so high and has been so experienced with no failures whatsoever, then we could work. But that's where multilateralism stops. And uh, uh, could then be renamed a sort of political pragmatism in the very meaning of 19th century pragmatism, uh, theories of pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Pragmatism, and slowly but surely, that's unfortunately my last question already, because we have to hand over. I could go on forever. But um, pragmatism sometimes invokes uh, the metaphor of a balance. And I think that, that uh, in what you said, there was a lot about this balancing. So on the one hand, politics should exert leadership over intelligence agencies. On the other hand, it should not interfere into their doings, just push them and push them until they say whatever the politicians want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, is this balance the normal state of affairs? So is this the interference, the lack of leadership, is that the exception or is it the other way around? Well, that's, that, that is a question with multiple, multiple answers, I would say. And the, 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 the institutional position of intelligence agencies in a country, in a democratic country, let me put it this way, because this is where we would address equilibriums of powers. In a totalitarian state, it's easy. It's very easy. The situation is quite complicated because it doesn't refer only to the mechanical relation between the political sphere and politicians and the guardians of the secrets, that's usually the domestic intelligence agencies, or the espionage agencies which are working abroad. I could easily slide into a sort of um, anecdotal answer, telling you that the more un, unadequate a politician is, the more likely to ask intelligence agencies for abuses. Because intelligence agencies are not dealing with, um, let's say, delicate things. It's about those kind of actions that would put, at, put us in quite an inappropriate position or maybe completely uncomfortable from eavesdropping to hidden influence. Um, and usually, oh, I have to interrupt myself here. I, it's, it just crosses through my mind now. It, it, the situation is like this, and I, I, need, I need to find the proper analogy so that we won't um, make abusive theories. Um, Leopards and tigers are beautiful cats when they're very little. Fluffy, very funny, they even smile. I mean, the difference between, the difference between themselves and little cats is in terms, should be interpreted in terms of beauty. Leopards and tigers are very beautiful when small. Once they grow 
And if they grow by their own wild rules, they would ask for food. And they would not choose between eating poultry or human flesh. This is what happens with intelligence agencies. When the reign of law is powerful enough, when the way laws are implemented is clear enough, when the laws themselves are well built, leaving no room for further interpretation, then the possibility of sliding into abuses gets dimmer. Democracies are not spared of this kind of tension between politicians who want and intelligence agencies who are subjected to their influence or power. On the other hand, um, that polar tension between politicians and agencies would not give us an idea about how experienced a democracy is. Because even in the most well-built democracies, abuses could happen. When, the, uh, when, when, when leopards and tigers are left out in the open, it doesn't matter how the zoological garden looks like. Whether it's full of green and people are there feeling happy with their kids, it's about their hunger. And they have this kind of objective to amass intelligence and information, no matter the means. And when I say no matter the means, it is really no matter the means. And all those means are from our common moral code, completely immoral. But there is an ethic of pragmatism that would say, good or bad, I do it for my country, or I do it for whoever represents my country. And then from that very ethical perspective, it's good. Now, when it comes to amassing intelligence by no means, there is something that certainly some people know already. Back in the late 60s, when the first theorists on intelligence theories, the first researchers who started working on intelligence as another facet of theories of communication or theories of political pragmatism, and by the way, they were all historians, because this is a missing link in historical scholarship, started to look into the means intelligence agencies would use to gather intelligence, realized that in all cases, four problems or four, four um, uh, uh, cracks into human personality would always prevail upon any other means of um, uh, catching intelligence. Because intelligence comes, okay, from human sources, could come from technical sources, could come from telephones, could come from internet, but in the end, it's the human source which is available. So which would be those cracks? They're four. And they are statistically repeated everywhere. The acronym is MICE, M-I-C-E. And it stands for money, ideology, compromise, and ego. So basically one could get intelligence. Switching somewhere into human personality, a very small, tiny, delicate resort that would bring up greed, or ideologic, ideological firmness, or convictions, or radicalism, or blackmail, but most of all, ego. I mean, it's mice, but certainly E from ego should be 
at the very start of this, of this acronym. It's like um, one of the words of uh, Goethe's Mephisto. This is what I like most in people. And egos are quite easily to lie or to twist. So um, this is how this relation goes. Sometimes, anecdotically speaking, intelligence agencies would use the mice upon the politicians, if necessary, if their existence is put in danger, maybe. But when intelligence agencies will enter through the back door or through the front door, the political realm, that's where democracy ends. That's where the executive becomes something else than the democratic, legitimate, institutional executive. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I'm going to keep quiet now and I'm going to hand over the words to you. And uh, I could imagine that there are quite a few questions. That's why I'm going to bundle them always in three. Okay, so just put your hand up where everyone's talk and, uh, and perhaps also briefly introduce yourself. Gerhard Reiviger, I'm a former Austrian diplomat. So my question to Michael is, um, a foreign minister um, is, we know what a foreign minister does, um, traveling around countries, um, and of course it's based on, his work is based on information that is fed into by the machine, that the, the diplomats abroad, which, which uh, provide the information. So, the, the diplomatic service is supporting the foreign minister in his actions, uh, which include a lot of travels abroad and meeting dignitaries at home. What exactly does the director of the foreign uh, inf the intelligence service do? What do you do with the information that is gathered by your agents abroad? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to gather two more questions. I have to write it down. Can you Are you okay? Good. Who else wants to go? Yes, please. Gentleman back. H hello, uh, I'm Adrian. I'm a PhD student here at TU. So I have to say I'm still a little bit confused about um, what exactly the point of an information service is. So you mentioned this connection to power, and uh, it's just not clear to me, so if Romania wants to negotiate something with, say, China or Bulgaria, what's, how does it help to have some kind of secret information? How does that translate into power? So what can you do with intelligence that you can't do with just old-fashioned diplomacy? And kind of related, do you think the world would be a better place if all countries dissolved their secret information? Um, agencies. Thank you. And then we have room for one more question. Yes, please. Erhard Pusek, retired. My question is uh, how so far uh, is the job of uh, diplomats partly also a job of spies? because uh, they have collected uh, information. I think the more interesting information they are giving to their government so that we remember are things which you cannot uh, collect normally with the information system in which we are living. So far, I think there are, are there really borders? Uh, and if, how are they handled? The second question is, how far are spies still necessary? Because I think by our information society, you can nearly experience everything. Uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the advantages of uh, internet, uh, the global connection in which we are living, and so on and so on. A lot of things are available. Besides personal facts, for example, uh, if you are collecting information, uh, what cases of Me Too by somebody of the government of another country is done and they can play it in the public or something like that. And this is a part of another question. Are there any limits or uh, is everything allowed concerning uh, 
nasty facts and so on and so on, especially for diplomats. Uh, if they are uh, a kind of hygiene by, by governments or not, for democracy. I think for dictatorship, it's not really a question. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna turn the word over to you again. Thank you, <coughs> thank you for the questions. I'll, um, I will regroup them so that in the end, uh, the answers, my answers would um, hopefully tend to um, uh, be explanatory enough for uh, to your to 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 you. Uh, first, about what does the director of the intelligence agencies do? Um, again, there is a difference between authoritarian or totalitarian countries and democratic countries. Let me start with the latter. In the democratic countries, the director is very much the manager, the political manager of the institution. I myself, I was no spy. I am no spy. Although you believe it or not. I wouldn't say it anyway. If I would have been. So you're now in a circle of, <laughs> a circle of paradoxes. No, directors are not spies. Directors are actually the link between the agency and the political dissidents. May they be in the executive, may they be in the parliament, it's up to every country to organize this. Second, yes, the director has access to basically everything that agency would do or plan or mend if necessary. Because in the end, the political responsibility is not with the technician as it is with the director himself. May he be politically appointed or not? Third, in most countries, directors are responsible for the dialogue between the, uh, I don't know how, how, how far this dialogue could be, could be taken, but the dialogue, let's suppose, the dialogue between the agency and the open world, mostly the journalists, the media. He is, again, asked, in most countries, to answer questions from specific commissions in their parliament, in the parliament, and to defend his positions or the agency's positions or plans or projects. So basically, this is, the, this is what the director would do, and I would say, just like ministers of foreign affairs would do, by representing the agency he or she directs it, in the dialogue with other peers, other agencies, he would do in a way the same job the Minister of Foreign Affairs would do in representing his or her country. So this is what the directors usually do in democratic countries. In totalitarian countries, that's a different thing. They are part of the inner circle of power. Imagine Beria, and then you will know exactly, or Dzerzhinsky, and then you will know exactly what I talk about. The heads of such agencies have been handpicked from the very close circle of the most important leader or ruler of the moment. Once that ruler is down, usually the head of the intelligence agencies is chopped off. It happened and still happens in some countries of, of the world. So, but again, that's a different situation. In a way, it's far easier to explain that situation than what happens in the, democ in, in the democratic countries. What is completely prohibited, and sometimes it goes it goes by law, sometimes it's a sort of an understanding of director's limits. 
apart from confidence, apart from the rule of, uh, from, from rules of speech, directors could not discuss the very inner secrets of the agency in the open and stuff like this, this is predictable. But in most countries, democratic countries, directors have to give up whatever political activity they would have had until the moment they would have been appointed heads of those agencies. And that's quite a serious, poses a serious problem to those who have been active politicians and suddenly they have to suspend themselves from all connections they would have had with their respective parties and disappear in a way from the political scene. There have been recent cases when this supposedly didn't happen. Because, and here is the risk. You've been into politics for 20 years and then you have to give up politics after building a political career and going back into the darkness. That darkness, prim primordial darkness you've been coming from with no public connection whatsoever, it's quite frustrating. Some people, no matter their age, would not resist this frustration. And there is always a temptation that comes with that E from ego. I know, quote unquote, I know a lot. Why should I not try to finger, to poke my fingers into politics? A bit. Nobody would observe it. That's false. It's a system. Everybody observes it. So this is, I would say, there are examples of not the pathology of politics, but the pathology of power in democratic states when it's conveyed by these types of institutions with a specific physiology to, um, uh, to knowledge. Um, how much of, of the diplomatic work, work activity uh, overlaps this, the activity of the spies? Well, that's a, a question that could be answered from a historical perspective. There's always something that would put diplomats very close to spies. If not general suspicion, then certainly an activity that would go that would mean like hunting for secrets. In our modern world, diplomats are theoretically trained, more or less, to understand that there is a difference between those two professions. Sometimes that very difference is very blurred and this is up to the interest of the state, sometimes it's quite solid. It tends to be blurred when it comes to the diplomatic representation of totalitarian states. Um, okay. The embassy of Romania in Vienna from before 1989, I doubt there were too many civilians in it. So that's a kind of example. Whereas in democratic countries, or in the diplomatic representation of democratic countries, there is a difference. There might be some gates open between those two professions, but there is nevertheless a difference. Now, when it comes to information, come back to what I was saying some good minutes ago. Diplomats have the capacity to negotiate in the framework of their mandate. Negotiating is one of the most important features of diplomatic activity. Apart from obtaining information about what's happening in the milieus a diplomat will randomly or on purpose perform his or her job. In this case, the spies are for a completely different job. The diplomats could not do it because they are after secrets in an illegal way. 
diplomats cannot reach information but in a legal way. And the 1961 and 1963 international conventions signed here in Vienna strike quite clearly what would separate a diplomat from a spy, nevertheless leaving enough room to have overlappings in the same individual if necessary. That's covert spies hidden into uh, the very appearance of a diplomat. That's something else. Now, why would the intelligence be necessary in a world that is um, where information could be found, I don't know, 90% of the available information could be found in the internet? Very simple, because this is a false truth. This is fake news in the end is not all the information in the internet. That information that is important in the sense it is, has a strategic value and therefore should be kept secret, it's not in the internet. Oh yes, we could have an idea about it. Or at least we could reap some illusions when roaming through the internet from alpha to omega and trying to see what's happening. But no. It's not in the internet for the simple fact that the internet is public, no matter the firewalls. Um, second, I was saying at the, at the moment that whatever is a secret of strategic importance should not be looked for in the technical realm, computers or telephones or I don't know, iPod, iPads and stuff like this because they have been built by human brains and they stay with humans, not with the machines. The machines would store them, but they would be in their real, maybe original form in human brains and therefore is the human target which is important. And here comes mice, money, ideology, compromise and ego. And this is why intelligence agencies have a lot to work on. Now, whether they're necessary or not, yes. They, they are and they will be for as long as I would presume this world would exist. Once again, spying is one of the oldest human professions and it would be one of the most lasting professions too simply because gathering intelligence is not just about reaching secrets it's about doing something with the secrets too it's about analyzing them synthesizing them extract something from them that would enable a country or a leader or a group of leaders, a nation, to defend himself, herself, itself from presumptive dangers. It's like a light in the dark. Countries need it so that this journey through a perilous night will not end, in a, end up in a disaster. Third. It's about prediction. It's not only about interpreting the world, it's about prediction as well. The more you can predict, the better you can defend yourself of any crisis. And finally, it's about building points of support beyond your borders. Those who have been caught through mice, they tend to become points of support. And then reaping intelligence is not just defensive, it becomes offensive. And I hope I have answered your question and Dr. Buzet's question too. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Unfortunately, we are already at the end, so um, time constraints one hour. 
Um, if you have any more questions, I'm sure you can come up here and, and, and talk to me uh, after the talk. Uh, let me say uh, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, it was a really fascinating conversation. I could have gone on forever with asking all kinds of questions, some technical ones I'd be interested in as well. Um, it's very rare to have a practitioner, someone who has been a practitioner, who has a lot of expertise, and then also is an intellectual, has a very, very sharp mind that enables him to reflect upon all of that. Uh, so, um, in that sense, uh, Mihai, thank you very, very much for your, for your talk.